Welcome to the Cosmic Eye Show, where we explore spiritual ideas and books that help you live a better life. Hosted by spiritual teacher and author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate, Jason Napolitano. All right. Hello. Welcome to the Cosmic Eye Show. I am your host, Jason Napolitano, and I have on the line Mr. Chris Sheridan. How are you doing, Chris? Doing great. Great to be here. Awesome. Chris is, of course, the co-host of the show. We are here each week bringing you esoteric, occult, psychological, mythological, religious, and or whatever else we can come up with subjects, uh, hopefully entertaining you. Uh, Our show is called Cosmic Eye, as you know, if you've been listening. Uh, We do need your help, and I wanted to say uh, one thing. Thank you for anyone who's supporting the show, uh, supporting us financially. We really appreciate that, and we can use all the help we can get. Uh, to help expand the show uh, and move forward and bring this material out to more people. So if you do enjoy this and you think it's important to bring the topics out to the to the larger world that we're talking about, uh, please do support us. We're at anchor.fm slash cosmic eye, C-O-S-M-I-C-E-Y-E, and we can put that up on the video. Um, we are on, on video today uh, as well as on the podcast. So please check that out. We'll have information about where you can, you can watch the video of Chris and I uh, each week if you want to watch that in addition to listening to the podcast or one or the other. Uh, so I'll put that information in the, the information that's under the podcast, the description part of it. So this week, we're going to talk about individuation, uh, Jung's concept of individuation, and some of the mystical past that he was interested in, Mr. Mr. C.G. Jung. And Chris is actually going to run the show today for the most part. I'm going to chime in uh, once in a while with, with my thoughts. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to you, Chris, and uh, go ahead and, and lead us into some, uh, some spiritually uplifting and psychologically illuminating uh, work today. No problem. Yeah, you're, like, you're like that. Did that, did that. did that really set everything up for you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> set me up for a fall, maybe. Uh, wow, so I'm glad we put, pick a, um, picked a very um, easy subject, young yeah, right. mysticism, <laughs> Good time. light reading to prepare for this one. Um, wow, heavy stuff, depth psychology, and, uh, but that's what this stuff is. It's very difficult to look at yourself fully and honestly, or to look at the world around you without getting to and through some of the difficult and sticky parts to it. Uh, But as you said, yes, we're going to talk about Jung's concept of individuation, um, what it means. We use some examples and descriptions, uh, what he thought it meant. Um, And then we're going to, the second part, we're going to discuss some of the different ancient traditions and uh, ancient wisdom sources that Jung seemed to pull from. It looks like he's all over the map. He wrote a book on alchemy and man and his symbols and myth and meaning and the I Ching and wrote about tarot cards. And it seems like, wow, he's he's all over the place. But he's not really all over the place. These are different versions of telling the same story. These are different methods uh, that the ancients uh, used to really what he thought described in their own way what he has termed the process of individuation. Um, So we'll go through that and some of those different um, old traditions and bring them into the 20th century uh, with Jung. And then we're going to bring everything home. What does it mean to us, the individual, individuation, yes, means a lot, and how we can apply some of these techniques Uh, And some of these concepts, because they're not just something to look at or something to entertain yourself with with some ideas, although I do find that entertaining, really the value in them, the ancient traditions as well as Jung's uh, teachings and his writings on individuation and, and other things, it's really meant to be practical and useful and to help you in your individual life with individuation. So... Uh, Jason, if you'd like to start uh, us off with um, a description, maybe of of individuation, or pull anything from Jung, maybe some background on Jung. Uh, Absolutely. So, as I understand it, I mean, there's hundreds of different descriptions of of the individuation process. Um, You know, that some more technical, some less technical than others. Uh, the 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 kind of clearest way that I that I understood it 
was described by Jung in, in this great video that is on, uh, on YouTube. It's a three and a half hour video of him being interviewed by a psychology student in, uh, in the United States. And um, he, he's asking Jung about, um, what, about the individuation process. And Jung's reply into, in terms of what, what that actually is, is he basically describes it as, as, uh, as an acorn being planted and an oak growing. It was a very simple description. And essentially, it was, you know, it's a metaphor for you know, the psychological and spiritual unfolding of, of one's, uh, one's inner being, one's uh, psyche. But really a, a beautiful and clear, clear way to put it. Uh, again, it's described in many different places in many different ways. But essentially, it's, the, it's man's and woman's search for his or her uh, self capital S self, the, the higher self with, within, or the totality and sort of um, spiritual idea of the self without and, and finding the, the merging of those, those, those two things. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a union of, of the opposites that can be described as that. There's, there's, there's a lot of different mythological language used to describe it. One of the, uh, the better, uh, uh, explanations that I found is I'm gonna I'm gonna give recourse to a book here uh, is in uh, Yolanda Jacobi's book uh, Psychology of C.G. Jung, right here, and uh, she she describes the process uh, quite well uh, in in her work and she draws mostly from Jung's work from uh, from Aon A I O N one of his most famous and and late, later works one of his most mysterious and challenging works, uh, but most important works. Uh, it describes essentially the process of individuation in, in Gnostic and, and, and sort of esoteric Christian terms, uh, but it, it's a very important work. Uh, so, that, I mean, that's, that's kind of a basic, basic outline of it. Uh, so, you know, maybe you can, you can lead us to the next, next stage and we'll move forward. Well, sure. The, um... When I first heard the term individuation, it almost seemed like, well, are you just becoming selfish or uh, removing yourself from society and from the world? And I'm just going to be my own person, uh, my own island. Uh, and that's not really the case. It, it um, really lends more towards um, being indivisible, uh, that you are both at the same time indivisible within. Um, and you're indivisible from the world around you, but you are a standalone, not a part, um, but this part of the whole, my part, this totality of my being um, is complete. It is whole, it is matured, uh, just like you were describing the acorn uh, fully maturing into an oak tree. And like an acorn or other seed, you know, we have this uh, at least the spark of it within us. And I know Jung talked about how this is really the goal of consciousness. Uh, you're using your consciousness to, to increase consciousness and the end result is becoming fully conscious. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, they, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, I, it also, one thing that struck me when you were saying that is, you know, there's a, there's a personal element to it and a transpersonal element to it. And the merging of those those two uh, into into sort of a, a, a one, but with the individuality in essence still intact. It's it's a it's a tough concept, but once you kind of wrap your mind around it, it does make make more sense. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but I wanted. To... Well, chime in. We're having a dialogue and discussion. That what makes the you know this podcast so great is that that we get to have this you know, not only just adding <laughs> two people together. Uh, but having that uh, exchange and interchange of ideas, and I hope people listening too uh, can chime in on the comment section and uh, let us know what you think. Uh, but Jung used a lot of uh, different uh, methods or examples, you know, from alchemy, the Chinese I Ching, uh, the tarot cards, myth, uh, rituals, masks, uh, dream symbolism and interpretation, uh, all lending towards this concept of the self, this larger self. We have our ego self and our persona, that which we kind of show to the world, but that's only part of it. We have uh, these maybe 
forgotten or disowned parts of ourselves that we don't want to look at, uh, some we are aware of, some we are not aware of, and they exist in the shadow, and the shadow is also part of our entire being. So I like to look at it as um, a, a sense of healing in the sense that, um, you know, the root word uh, healing uh, has to do with becoming whole, that it's your whole and complete, you know, there's parts you yeah. like about yourself, the part you don't like about yourself. They've all come together now and uh, brought uh, you into a complete whole self, of which the ego is one very, very important part, but it's just a part uh, in it, Jung also was involved in very early on in 12-step uh, recovery and uh, in the big book. Uh, you can read, read about that very early on. And it was, you know, using this spiritual prescription and that is to you know, believe in a higher power. And that can be an internal thing. You don't necessarily have to believe in God or something like that, but it can't just be you, just your ego self. <laughs> there has to be something mm -hmm. beyond who we are and what we are, uh, and to really get a sense. And to become that, you also have to let go of who you thought. Yeah, uh, yeah exactly. That. Let me let me jump in real quick. I, I think it's important to contextualize this uh, for the listeners. One thing that, that we, we didn't talk about in the beginning in the introduction, which I think is important, is to understand why this idea of individuation and why this particular new mythology uh, is critical. Uh, in other words, why is it even is it even important for us to understand this today? And one of the things that that both all I should say Jung saw this, and many of the uh, romantics, many of the people in the early modern age saw this as, as well. That we as uh, as humans were losing our our mythology. We were losing our myth. In other words, the, in the West, for us, that myth uh, that that overriding myth was, was the Judeo-Christian tradition. Mostly, you know, for most people, it was the Christian tradition. And so when that, that, uh, that, that mythology and that, the power of that, the trajectory of that particular religious movement began to come into question uh, and people began to look at it historically and, and critically and so forth as the, uh, as the scientific and modern sort of uh, thinking came into play, we, we gradually lost faith as it were in that in that understanding in that mythology and and jung and many other uh, many other uh, spiritually inclined individuals at that time felt that that we were losing something that was essentially human about ourselves and so this new path of individuation that jung is proposing and that a lot of people have picked up on is a new is a new myth that involves ancient myths it involves new myths it involves story and and things that are important in our lives today but understood in a new way and in a sense it resurrects uh the ideas of christianity and judaism and and other religious ideas in a in a new understanding and in a new light and that's why this understanding of individuation is, is a very important concept so i just wanted to kind of frame that I'm, I'm, again i'm sorry for interrupting but i think that that's important for people to to understand wh why we're even talking about this. Do you know what I mean? I do, that's great. And thank you for, uh, for adding that. Um, one thing um, oh, I will add to the myth uh, that we're losing, uh, that perhaps we have lost, in an odd way, we've actually regained it in the movies. Uh, they are the, I don't know if the movies are the new myth, but it's definitely the new methodology by which we can get in touch with myth and what it means uh, to become more of ourselves. Uh, even just American, good old American movies or any Western movie uh, actually does a pretty good job with this. In two hours, uh, most of the time, you'll see the hero, the protagonist, uh, start out a certain way and then they have to go through something and at the end, uh, they have to let go who they were and become who they really are. And that story theme, which is, you know, parallels um, Joseph Campbell's uh, hero's journey, uh, the departure, the initiation, and then the return, has resonated so much. And I think that's why we like some of these movies, how we identify with the characters, uh, because we want to become something 
more than who we are, or we feel that we have something in us that is more than what we're utilizing and, and what we're living out through our lives. We want to become that. So we have this seed, this dormant seed that wants, wants to have life again. And we can see in movies, even flawed characters that get redeemed at the end or um, somehow have to become a better version, a bigger version of who they were when the movie started. When or the equation you can use to to look at the uh, you know this process is that um, the hero starts out as person B and goes through trials and tribulations C uh, to become or B rather <laughs> to become person C at the end. So mm -hmm. it really is a a myth in the uh, the Campbell hero's journey sense in so many movies. Just quick examples, um, can use Luke Skywalker, of course he started out, and really the time frame is very, very short in the original Star Wars movie. Uh, yes, he's a good pilot to begin with. Yes, he has uh, a lot of technical knowledge, um, and uh, but he gets caught up in this whole situation, uh, leaving his planet, um, getting involved with this group of characters, uh, saving a princess, all these very, uh, very rich mythological uh, things. Uh, the death of the mentor that gives him a sacred object like uh, the Excalibur uh, and the sacred knowledge on how to use it. And at the end, there's a scene when he's in the trench at the Death Star and he hears Obi-Wan's voice and he's using all the technology. He's got his ship, he's got the proton torpedoes, he's got the targeting computer. And he hears this voice that says, let go, trust your feelings. And he turns off, consciously, he turns off the tech, uh, the technology that, that he had been relying on and so well versed with. That had been really a strong point because he you know, fixed robots and droids and things. Uh, but to turn that off and let your feelings go, let that larger extend out uh, and use the force. So... You know, he started out as a farm kid and ended up a, uh, a nubile uh, a Jedi Knight at the end in just a, a few short days. Um, Casablanca, Rick Blaine, he starts out a very discouraged, uh, bitter cynic, mm -hmm. um, you know, hurt by love. And then, of course, his lover, also, you know, he was hurt by, um, shows up again and, oh my God, here's this shadow. He tried to stuff it down with alcohol and moving away and, far from Paris and her as you could ever imagine and of all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world and she walks into mine is the line from the movie and of course that sends him in a complete tailspin but it actually brings out something in him something that he never was before that he maybe never thought he could be mm -hmm. and see this at the end because he becomes selfless and through unconditional love he gives up his place on the plane uh, to Lisbon and gives it to uh, Laszlo and Ilsa. So he, you know, very selfish, very cynical, and then he's very hopeful and unselfish, unconditionally loving, uh, sacrificing, and at least potentially sacrificing himself for the greater good. So same person, completely different person by the end of, again, another, you know, maybe three or four day uh, yeah. movie timeline. It seems, uh, too, there's a, those are great examples. Uh, thank you for both of those. It seems also that there is a, there's a sort of a process going from a sort of a, a fragmentation, a sort of fragmented personality to, to a wholeness. That's that, that progression. And again, uh, that Luke uh, Skywalker example is very good in, in the terms of, in terms of him, um, you think about that, he's, he's, Letting go of the the ego, he's letting go of that that technology. It's almost like a, it's a really powerful myth for our time. We are very reliant on technology, the scientific outlook, thinking, etc. In the end, in order to accomplish his goal, he has to let go of all those tools, and he has to trust himself. He has to trust his higher self. He has to trust the force, and thus he's able to to transform. And um, Rick in Casablanca is another good thing. He's, you know, he's, 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 he's another good example because he is, he is uh, giving up something. He's giving up uh, his own ego needs for, for the greater good. And it's the same sort of a, uh, same sort of a mythological uh, motif, I think. 
Uh, so both great examples. One thing that I, I did want to bring up as well is the idea of uh, the individuation process. And it's going to take uh, different forms for different people. You know, there are steps along the way. Uh, two of the bigger steps you, you kind of, uh, you did highlight uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a small way in your, in your overviews. Uh, the, the first, generally speaking, the first step in the individuation process, as I understand it, I mean, obviously everyone's journey is different. But generally speaking, in psychoanalysis and in the individuation process through depth psychology, uh, the first the first uh, archetypal sort of idea that you meet with is the idea of the shadow, uh, and that's where we begin to understand that the parts of ourselves that we don't accept we project onto other people and turn into somewhat of an enemy. I suppose the shadow figure, in essence, is sort of a dark father as well, Darth Vader, dark father. I, I read that the other day. I thought that was fantastic. I had never made that connection before. Uh, but Darth Vader also represents the, the shadow part of Luke. You know, oftentimes the shadow figures in dreams or or in um, in mythology literally come out of the shadows or they're in dark clothing, they have dark hair. You know, Darth Vader had a dark mask on, a black mask. So they, they, they you know, they, they tend to, to have that kind of symbology uh, or symbolic motifs. So, you know, those are, that's, that's kind of the first stage. And then the second portion of it is then uh, the understanding of the opposites, uh, the anima or the animus, which are the, that's the contrasexual element with it within us. So as a, as a male, the contrasexual uh, element would be the anima. Uh, that's just like a sort of soul figure. So the sort of feminine in man and in, in the female, it would be the animus, which is the sort of masculine, symbolically speaking. Uh, portion of, of, of herself. Uh, so we have to come to some understanding that there are those different parts of ourselves. Those play out in, in the female characters or the male characters, depending upon who the, uh, the particular hero or heroine is in the story. And, and those are you know, two, two of the first kind of portions of the individuation process. It goes on and, and, and we won't have time to cover all the stages, but those, those are two very basic things that are pretty easy to see, particularly in, in mythology and, and movies. So I just, I wanted to add, add that as well. Okay, great. And um, Jung, throughout his career, uh, seemed like he approached individuation using, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, different sources of ancient wisdom and examples of transformation. Um, one he really spent a lot of time with, and I know we've, we've talked a lot about Manly Hall and done uh, several podcasts on the secret teachings, Actually, when Jung decided to write his book, Alchemy and Psychotherapy, he borrowed from Mr. Hall's collection um, several uh, documents, uh, manuscripts, uh, symbols, uh, books of images, and these alchemical processes, um, because he felt that alchemy you know, presented a, and also alchemy is from the West, uh, but it presented, um, like what you're talking about, the different steps and stages, because alchemy isn't just, well, you turn the lead to gold. You go through all these processes. And so individuation is a process that has that suffix, you know, T-I-O-N. Uh, so in alchemy, you have calcination, you have distillation, uh, you have mortification, fermentation. And, uh, and so it, those are all those are all different different phases of, of the individuation process uh, represented uh, symbolically through, through alchemy. And those are things that actually occur within, within us, right? Well, that's really the point. And even uh, like we were talking about movies, um, like Star Wars and yeah, somebody sacrificed for the greater good or became a greater person for the greater good. Um, the individu individuation process, yes, it will help uh, the collective, but it really takes place in the laboratory of your own individual self. Uh, so there may be external metaphors changing uh, lead to gold, but really you're changing your own leaden or heavy, uh, dark, tarnished uh, aspects of yourself. And through you know, distillation, calcination, all these different processes, you're changing it you're changing you you're changing your consciousness what you think about how you think about things uh, what's important what's not uh, to get to this gold state and gold is such a great metaphor because it's a metal that doesn't tarnish um, you can do anything you want to it 
and you can, no matter what, you can you melt it back down again, even if it's stuck in rock. If you get it hot enough, it comes out gold. So it's there's this purity uh, to it, as well as you know value. It's, it's definitely a more sure. valuable metal. But yeah, it's exactly. really what we're doing in ourselves. We're making ourselves golden from our leaden um, self. And it doesn't happen, uh, and again, it's not just a one-step process. So it may take um, a lot of looking at the shadow, like you're talking about reconciling the opposites. That's a really big theme, especially when uh, Jung uh, talks about the I Ching, the Chinese divination uh, tool that's thousands of years old. Uh, it's the same thing with yin and yang. They're, they are seemingly separate and very, very different and, of course, opposite uh, ideas or forces or concepts, uh, but that's more of an illusion. They are just two sides of the same coin, different in form or in appearance, uh, and maybe their function and process, but they don't, ex they can't exist without each other. And I think that's a really big problem that uh, in the West, especially uh, in the United States, is a problem. And it's everywhere from our political uh, theory that we have this two-party system, which mm -hmm. really makes no sense whatsoever. There's no chance of a coalition. It's kind of winner takes all. So you have these opposing, it's yay or nay, it's, you know, left or right. You can't have left without right conceptually. We seem to think that politically, that it's, well, it's either God or science. Um, well, you can really have both. And if you don't know that, read Einstein. He talks a lot about God. And of course, he's a great scientist. So uh, that, that those even seem to be split or at odds with each other. Now they can take competing ideas because you're looking at something through a different lens, but really you have to have both. And that's where Taoism with yin and yang, where alchemy, and you're talking about this fragmentation, our personality becomes fragmented in the Inca tradition uh, with the shamans. They believe that at any point along your life, uh, any trauma that you suffer, uh, any uh, loss or you know, rite of passage or a difficult change you go through, uh, that every time that happens, part of your soul <laughs> is actually broken off. It doesn't go away. It's still hanging around there somewhere, but it's not integrated. And there's a procedure called soul retrieval. It's a whole shamanic uh, ritual uh, that, you know, is fairly involved, but in the simple version is that you get all these broken pieces and you bring them back together. They're reintegrated. Uh, they're welcomed back. Mm. Being mm -hmm. That sounds uh, a lot like uh, the idea of the complexes and the different parts of ourselves that get, that gets split off in, uh, in, in, Jungian, uh, in Jungian terms. And the and that would be part of that individuation process is, is reintegrating those, those sort of broken off pieces of ourselves. Oftentimes, you know, speaking of the shadow, the parts of ourselves uh, that, we, that we tend to reject, that don't fit into the sort of norm of society or our own role in the family or uh, what have you, tends to get shoved down uh, into this portion of the unconscious known as the shadow. And you know, Freud saw that really as a as the unconscious as sort of a storehouse for all of the sort of negative and evil aspects, I guess, of, of, of human life. Uh, whereas Jung saw uh, the potentiality for for our own uh, our own greatness in there as well. So it's, it, we can we can even sort of uh, repress or shove down parts of ourselves into the shadow that are are gold in essence. And I think sometimes speaking of uh, the sort of metaphor of alchemy that's where the, the, the gold is actually in the shadow. The gold is, is in that dark part of ourself and has to be sort of excavated out. Um, and I think that's a really nice metaphor for that. So really all these things you're talking about, these, the I Ching, uh, the, this sort of shamanistic way of doing things, alchemy, all just different um, uh, symbolical systems, metaphors, um, ways of of facilitating the individuation process as you understood it would you would you agree well definitely and even like i mentioned before the work he did um really at the onset uh he's kind of the spiritual father of the 12-step program and that whole movement that those are 12 steps <laughs> that is an individuation process where you come in and you're one way an addict alcoholic 
And by the 12th step, you are definitely sober. <laughs> you would definitely have to be. And you are, you are at the point where you're sponsoring other people, conducting meetings, and you, you are now the mentor helping the sick and suffering uh, in, in the rooms uh, of, of the 12 step program. Uh, one easy example, probably the easiest one that I don't, I don't know how, if Jung would agree that this would be individuation, um, but as far as alchemical processes go, uh, the example I like uh, so much is baking a cake. Whereas, you know, you start out at the beginning and you have in alchemy, uh, the prima materia, that's the initial stuff that you're working with. So if it's metals, you know, you're starting with lead. Uh, and if it's you, or like you mentioned the acorn, um, you're starting with this seed. The acorn has the oak tree in it, but it has to go through a process. It needs to be activated. So it needs to be put into the ground. It needs to be watered. It has to have minerals. And when it sprouts, it has to have light and, and continuing that light water mineral <laughs> process uh, for many years. And it becomes a, a full grown oak tree. But um, alchemically, if you just want to think uh, of baking a cake, you have, you know, the first ingredients, the prima materia. You have the flour and the baking soda and the sugar, uh, a couple eggs. I don't know what else you need, butter maybe. Um, so you have the stuff, but on their own, it just looks like a bunch of stuff. And then you mix it all together. Um, that's this coagulatio uh, process of, of alchemy. And then you just have this disgusting mush uh, it doesn't look good, doesn't taste good, the texture's awful, you would never serve somebody this, uh, but then you subject it to the heating process, this calcinato, this uh, trial by fire. So you put it in the oven, and then that the oven is like the crucible uh, that cooks this thing, or if it's you're working with metal, that you have to heat it up uh, to get the dross and the impurities out of it. Uh, and in the example of a cake, what happens is you end up with something that's, it contains all those pieces, uh, but since they've been mixed and put, you know, down with water and stirred and, uh, and then baked, you have something that is wholly different as well. And that's the end result. The individuated self is really different than uh, the ego self. It contains it, but it's been mixed and cooked, <laughs> so to speak to where it becomes like a tree matured and it is really a wholly different substance um, or you could take like a, a watch all the parts of a watch you have a spring and a cog and a gear and a hand and a winder and you know and all these different things uh, each of them needs to function properly on their own but when you put them together in the correct way it becomes something wholly different now it becomes a timepiece now it becomes something that really can work in the world. So uh, you can think of those things also as- that's, Yeah, no, that's a fantastic metaphor for that. Um, I, was, I was struck by that. And you know, the, as I was thinking about that, all those different processes that you were, you were speaking of there, the Latin names and so on, uh, sometimes can get overwhelming. One of the great uh, books that, that uh, both of us like, and uh, I don't know if you showed this one earlier, I don't remember, but Anatomy of the Psyche. Uh, Edward Edinger is a fantastic guide and a very readable and understandable uh, book that that lays out all of those different steps. Of course, alchemy is is wildly complicated and contradictory, and it is a chaotic mess in a lot of ways, and that is the beauty of it. But uh, Edinger manages in this uh, anatomy of the psyche to be very clear and to to connect those things to the process of individuation that you were talking about um, in your cake analogy uh, in a very, very uh, interesting and, and, and readable way. So I just wanted to make sure that, that the, uh, the listener and the, the watchers of, of the video can, can see that, that book that we draw from. All right. Well, I guess now we can uh, move on yeah, to- We're gonna have to unfortunately start to wrap it up. Well, because let's, we let's get to the next phase about the- Absolutely. Uh, uh, what does this mean? Okay, so we've, we've talked about Jung and individuation. We've described uh, movie examples and different alchemical and I Ching, uh, different uh, processes of, 
a becoming whole or a shamanistic uh, soul retrieval to become one, to become whole, holy ourselves. Um, how does that play out in our lives now, today? Not looking backwards, but looking really in front of us. And how can I individuate? What are the things you can do uh, to bring all these broken pieces, these fragments, and pull them out of the shadow and invite them back and have them fit together in the right amounts in the right way so that we become something more uh, than what we were when we started? You know that you bring up a, a great point, and that uh, reminded me of, uh, of, a, of a lecture that I listened to uh, by Edward uh, Edinger, and it's called uh, Individuation, Man's Myth, Man's Modern Myth, or Modern Myth for Man, something like that. It's on, uh, it's on YouTube. And I think he has a book of the same, the same title. He's also drawing from his uh, book, The Creation of Consciousness, when he talks about this. But um, one of the things that he points out that's a very good way of getting started with this material uh, to even understand that there's different parts of ourselves to understand the concept of projection, the shadow, and so on, is to begin to look at things in your daily life that push your buttons. Things that you love, things that you hate, people that push your buttons for no particular reason. Uh, those are the sources uh, that are most uh, active in us uh, that we're probably most unaware of. Uh, so they are generally connected to the shadow portion uh, of ourselves. And, and that's something that we can do. We can take a look at something that bothers us to a great degree. We hate it. You know, we're passionately angry against this or that particular thing. We're indignant against this or that particular movement or this or that leader. And we can see what is in ourselves that is like that. So it's, it's a difficult process, but when we, when we do look at it, it's very illuminating. So you've got to analyze those things that really, um, really move you one way or the other. Either you love them or you hate them. And I think that that, that emotional content, that, that affect that's, that's connected to that is a really good sign that there's something constellated within you. In other words, there's a there's a, something, there's, a, there's probably a complex or some portion of yourself or something that you don't want to necessarily acknowledge in your own psyche that you're projecting out onto the world or out onto another person or situation that you need to look at within yourself. And it's difficult to do, but it is, it is very illuminating. Even to understand that there are different parts of ourselves is sometimes challenging. You think, oh, well, these different parts of myself, I must have multiple personality disorder or something. And it's, that's not what we're getting at. If, I mean, if you, if you slip in and out of personalities, that's, you know, well beyond what we're, what we're talking about it requires, you know, serious psychiatric, um, psychiatric care. But what I'm talking about is these different things that move us within these different parts of ourselves that seem to, you know, sort of seize us at times, you know, we're, we're somewhat out of our right mind, as we might say. Um, you know, we get seized by those, those, those impulses that we, afterwards, when we're calm, we look back and go, what the hell did I do that for? You know, and, and, and how often, how often do we do that? We, we just blow up at someone for, for, for reasons well beyond our, our conscious mind. Those are the things I'm talking about. When you can start to shed some light on it, on, the, on those things those things that move you so deeply and so sort of unconsciously, you begin to get uh, in touch with those different parts of yourself and you begin to get a handle on, on, on who you are and you can, you can integrate those things into a, into a whole. And, and, and Jung always said in all of the first uh, generation uh, analysts always spoke about how there, there's no such thing as a perfect person. Well, we're not striving for perfection, we're striving for wholeness. It's a different concept than trying to be this pure, perfect person that's without sin or without any blemishes or imperfections. And it's saying, okay, look, this is me, warts and all, and I accept that. I'm trying to work on the things that I have issues with, and then I'm you know, projecting onto others. I'm trying to pull those projections in. It's one thing Jung said was, oh, I heard that talk. What would be cool is if people were watching this video and we could actually show them the dog, because we talk about that dog 
every week in this podcast. And if we could show that dog, we'd really be on to something. You could set your watch to that dog. I it? love that dog. I love that dog. <laughs> uh, so, but the point is, hey, one thing that Jung said, just then I'll stop and I'll let you, you take over again. I'm sorry. Uh, is that, you know, when people would ask him if he thought we were going to survive into the future, uh, this was at a time when nuclear war seemed imminent. Russia and the United States were at, at loggerheads, and there was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And all, well, actually, this is pre-Cuban Missile Crisis, excuse me, uh, because he died before then. But uh, there was there was a lot of tension about the atomic age, and you, you know, Jung would always say, "Look, I, I don't know what the future holds, but he said I think we have a pretty good chance." I'm paraphrasing poorly. I think we have a pretty good chance. If we, if we work on our own consciousness and if we all become conscious enough. And so, you know, that's another thing about individuation. It's not a mass process. It's not an ism. It's not a utopian ideal. It's us each working on our own issues within so that we can create a sort of a, a new cultural and, and sort of spiritual zeitgeist uh, with our own contribution of consciousness to the, to the whole. So. With that being said, I'll, I'll pass it back to you. But um. very good point, and that probably brings us to a actually good a good place to close on this. Uh, as the word implies, individuation, uh, it it's an inside job. It takes place inside your psyche. Now, you were talking about projections. If there's something you don't like about another person, or something you really do like about a person, or a mythic or movie character. Uh, is probably something you don't like or do like about yourself um, because we, you know, like a projection, you have to put it out on the wall to be able to see it. And with shadow work, you think, well, you know, you have to dig down deep and in the depths and the dark recesses of our consciousness. Actually, you don't have to dig too deep. If you were mining, you would need a very short drill <laughs> because they're there. They're there all the time we're not aware of them because we don't want to be, or we're not trained to be, or we just don't have that concept. Um, but you, and sometimes they rise up anyway. Mm -hmm. the notion of a Pluto crisis, the Pluto being the God of the underworld, um, that if there are shadow elements and you're very, very right. And just like in a, an actual gold mine or diamond mine, um, it's deep in the earth and you have to cut through rock and layers of strata and, all these things to get to it, and it's a difficult, you know, process. Uh, but in a Pluto crisis, the underworld um, realizes that if there's something that you haven't dealt with, or something that really needs your attention, your consciousness to be brought up into the light, into the present, it will create some sort of a crisis in the outer world. So there is this parallel between the and deep, deep connection between the inner life and the outer world, but the what individuation can address and solve really can't be done by electing a different person in office or passing a new bill or having some different kind of social structure that's going to go from the outside and then come into us uh, it actually works the other way now we have evidence around us we can see things because we have to see them and they have to be in front of us. So whether somebody is mirroring back something we need to see uh, or somehow we are projecting that out onto another person and saying, look at what they're doing. Can you believe they, oh, aren't I like that a little bit myself? <laughs> now, sometimes it's like a circus mirror that it's like, oh, it's all exaggerated. But always ask if, yeah, if you're really um, put out by something somebody does, say, well, am I like that? And um, yeah, personally, yeah. Uh, one of the things I've had uh, trouble with, I guess, or I've felt I had trouble with, maybe I really don't, um, is uh, is being listened to. I think, well, no one's listening to me. Why don't you hear what I have to say? I have all this good advice. Why won't you listen? Um, and then I pull back and go, hmm, maybe there's something I'm not listening to. Maybe I'm not listening to my higher self. Maybe I'm not listening to my own self. Mm. So it can always be put back on you, and it is an inside job. So this laboratory is our own existence. It is our own everyday lives. And we don't have to dig too deep. As a matter of fact, a lot of these shadow things are really hanging around. What we have to do, though, is turn an eye towards them and try not to be afraid. And this may sound a little like you're talking about schizophrenia, 
um, you have to kind of separate yourself from these things. Like, why do I always do that? I always self-sabotage. It's like, that's part of you. It's not you, all of you, but it's because if it is all of you, then, then there's no chance. You have no yeah, chance. Exactly. I do this wrong and I have to change this about me. I have to change everything. It's a lot of the change comes through just being aware of these things and welcoming uh, them back in. And you could even ask them, okay, self-sabotage, you could name it. Um, why, why are you doing this to me? Like almost put it a little bit, get a little bit of gap, a little bit of objective. Speaking of that, uh, and I don't mean to interrupt, but Robert Johnson's book um, on active imagination and different processes that you can do to do this work on your own, uh, inner work, Robert Johnson, inner work is an, is an excellent guide for that kind of, that kind of, that kind of practical work. Uh, confronting those inner inner figures and those inner inner complexes and so on. So, just wanted to add oh, that. Great, great. Well, if they have been broken off through a childhood trauma or adult trauma or anything, um, they're probably hurt too. They're probably wounded in some way. These aspects of yourself. So, it also takes a light touch. Have a little compassion for yourself and these disowned or unrealized parts of yourself make a welcoming environment uh, like you might at a 12-step meeting come on in yeah you're all stinky and messed up from your binge the night before but come on in there's there's a seat for you we'll see if if we can do something uh, so it's it's owning them but it's also inviting them in and the scary stuff doesn't have to be too scary uh, it's a lot more scary when we don't address these things because then like the the monster under the bed or in the closet in the darkness yeah. you can make it as big and as horrible and traumatizing as you wish uh, but if you flick on a light switch it's like oh okay that was just a little shadow going across the wall that really wasn't that big of a thing they lose a lot of their power yeah exactly power. exactly that's a great point that's a great way to to kind of summarize that is is that you know in this in this work always remember that you that you need to have respect for these different parts of yourself and have some some compassion i mean i think too often we we look at these parts of ourselves we don't like and we we beat up on on them and and in the process and on, on ourselves um unfortunately we, we we do have to stop there uh, thank you again, Chris, for, for, for that hosting and, and uh, a great job there. I appreciate it. A wonderful uh, show on individuation. I want to go over those books really quickly that we talked about uh, one more time. So Anatomy of the Psyche, Edinger, E-D-I-N-G-E-R, uh, Jung, C.G. Jung, The Psychology of C.G. Jung, Yolanda Jacobi, uh, J-A-C-O-B-I, Jacobi is how they pronounce it, actually, J-A-C-O-B-I. We didn't talk about this one, but this one is... Owning Your Own Shadow, uh, Robert Johnson, it's an excellent one. Uh, Creation of Consciousness, Ed, uh, Edinger again. So all great books. Uh, again, thank you, Chris, great work. Um, we are here every week on the Cosmic Eye Show and now on uh, the video Cosmic Eye Show. Uh, so please continue to join us each Sunday for a new episode. Um, please support us if you can, anchor.fm slash Cosmic Eye. And Chris is the author of uh, Spirit in the Sky. I am the author of If You Can Worry, You Can Meditate. And please uh, purchase our books if you get a chance. I think you will enjoy uh, both of those. And we wish you all the best. Have a great week. Goodbye and God bless. Mm -hmm.